right, uh, welcome to this session. Uh, this session is, um, is basically my story. It's, um, we've been using the, and suggesting G1 to our customers. And um, my story was that there was uh, not very much information around on the internet uh, regarding how G1 really worked internally. So I had to do some research, I had to contact people, I had to look into the hotspot code in order to figure out few details that I was very interested in. So this session is basically about me telling you what I discovered and um, hopefully you will find this interesting. Um, I work for an American company called Webtide. We provide support for uh, the Jetty open source project. We're basically the company that employs the Jetty committers. Um, we are you know, very active in the open source and we have um, right now move to implement HTTP2, and uh, we are very happy with that. And um, I gave other presentation on HTTP2. And, um, you know, Jetty is a 20 years old uh, open source project. It was uh, first released in 96, end of 95, uh, using Java 0.9. Uh, as a context, uh, the Sun at the time was um, putting out in order to encourage people to start writing uh, using Java. And so Jerry was one of those submissions, and you know, 20 years later, we're still here, we're still kicking ass. So it's a, it's a very interesting project. Uh, if you don't use it, take a look because it's uh, super interesting. But let's go into G1. So G1 is now in JDK8 the low pose collector, and the first paper of this collector dates back to 2004. So it's now theoretically in the theory, in the algorithm, etc. It's now 12 years old, and it's basically four years old in production, and it's supported by Oracle. So it's uh, it's been designed to be the long-term replacement for CMS, and. Um, it has been targeted as a low pose and it will probably become the default collector in JDK 9. Uh, the reason being that the majority of Java applications actually benefit of very short uh, uh, collection pose times. Um, so if you have a web application, you really want the interaction with your user to be super fast. You don't want to you know, pose for five, 10 seconds uh, to do a full garbage collection on the server before answering an HTTP request. And if you are on the UI side, uh, maybe you're writing JavaFX or whatever, or Zwing or whatever, you still want to uh, be very fast because maybe you're rendering frames and you have a very fixed budget in time that you need to be able to, uh, to stay within in order to render your frame. So it's, uh, it's very important that the garbage collection is very efficient, and especially in the low pose uh, uh, si aspect of it. So G1 has been designed to be really, really easy to tune. Theoretically, you just need two parameters. You need the max heap size, and you want to detail how long is the stop the word pose that you're willing to accept. Okay, in this case, for example, is 100 milliseconds. Um, so these two parameters should be enough. Um, there's no infinite long uh, tuning command lines that we had with CMS. Um, G1 is supposed to be this simple. However, this presentation uh, will show you that it's not that simple. There are many other tuning parameters that you may want to use. And, um, and we'll you know, go into the details in this. G1 is also a generational collector, like all the other collectors that are in the JDK. Uh, this means that uh, it basically divides the heap into two major zones. One is called the young uh, generation, and, uh, and then the old generation. And it has two different algorithms for each generation. In particular, uh, G1 has a typical, like all the other collectors in Hotspot, it's a stop the world parallel copying algorithm, very classic. Uh, the old generation is what is very different in G1. Um, what it does is basically performs a mostly concurrent marking, uh, very similar to what CMS does, but then, differently from CMS, it doesn't do any sweeping. It doesn't reclaim the space immediately. We will see in a bit of, uh, in more details how exactly does it, um, but basically uh, it piggybacks this operation of reclaiming the space in the old generation into a young generation collection. We'll see the details. Um, this is an important slide because uh, G1 is very detailed logging. So I 
always suggest that you keep these flags enabled in your application. They have very little overhead in, uh, in your application um, throughput, and, but they provide you very important information. Uh, when you have a problem with G1, if you don't have the switches enabled that tells you why G1 failed and when, then uh, it is going to be very difficult for you to figure out something. So uh, always keep them enabled. Uh, they provide a lot of information that it's uh, parsable by tools. It's parsable by custom parser that you can write. Um, it's very easy. So it's a very important uh, thing to keep these enabled. So let's go in a little bit more details now about the G1 memory layout. So I guess you're familiar with this um, uh, picture here. Uh, who's familiar with this? Well, most of you. So, well, forget about it, it's because G1 <laughs> is very different from this. Uh, G1 targets and divides the heap into regions, what they're called regions. They're pretty small. Uh, G1 targets 2,048 total regions. So if you make a small heap, it tries to make 2,000 regions that are very small. If you have a large, large heap, it still makes 2,000 regions, which now are, of course, bigger. Um, then it tags those regions with particular names, and it says, OK, I want uh, uh, these regions to be called add-on regions, or survival regions, or old regions. They're, these concepts are you know, very similar to the concept that we have in the other collectors. But there's one more region type, uh, which is called the humongous region, uh, which means uh, that that particular region contains one object only, typically very large, that occupies at least 50% of the region size. So when such large objects, typ typically by array or char array, um, are allocated, then um, and then they occupy more than 50% of the region, then that region is called humongous. We will see why they are special. So this is basically the G1 memory layout. Uh, it's, it's very different from the other one, but we have free regions, we have old regions, add-on region, humongous region, survival regions, and so forth. So how, how G1 works? Um, well, let's dive into details. Well, the G JVM starts. It allocates these regions, it allocates the heap, allocates the region, tags them all, and say, okay, this bunch of regions here, they're empty for now, but they're, I'm, they're my add-on regions, okay? Then the application starts and starts allocating, and uh, G1 starts filling one region. Say, okay, you are the first region, fill it up. When you're full, it goes to the second add-on regions and fills that up, and then it goes to the third and fills that up, and fourth and fills that up, and so forth, right? When all the add-on regions uh, that G1 has allocated and has uh, uh, reserved to be add-on regions, when all of them are full, then G1 starts a young generation collection. Um, however, allocating is not the only thing that your application does. Uh, the other thing that your application does is to modify existing pointers, okay? So one big question was, uh, okay, let's assume that there is a, an object in an old region that points to an object in the Eden region, okay? That can hamper, for example, if you have a typical case, it's a map that you allocate at the very beginning of your application. And then later on uh, in the life cycle of your application, uh, you insert a new object in that particular map. Okay, so the map has lived long enough to, to go into the old uh, region, in, into an old region. But the new element, it's a new map entry, and it's going to be allocated right now into an Eden region. So you have a pointer that goes from an old region to a young region. And so G1 must track these intergeneration pointers. It has to track from old or humongous, uh, remember this could be an array, into Eden or survivor of, okay? Why it has to do that? Well, because if we look at uh, one single Eden uh, region, it looks like this. There's an uh, object D pointing to F, and then there is object E. But because nobody is pointing to D and nobody is pointing to E, we can say, well, this is all garbage. Nobody points to this object. There's no way to reach object D from outside. And so, you know, this region is basically full of garbage. It's, and I can reclaim and, you know, use it for allocation of other objects. 
However, when you take into account that there may be inter-region pointers, then the situation is very different. Yeah. It's, uh, it could be like this, okay? There could be an old region that points to D and an old region that points to E, and then there could be an external pointer. These external pointers are called the roots uh, that points to A. So this could be, for example, a static field in a class. The points to A, the points here, the points here, and now you can actually see that these two objects are alive because they are pointed to from another object. While, for example, B is an object that nobody points to it, so it's dead, but points to another object here, and so this one is dead too, but, you know, you have to figure it out. It's not that simple. So, but then it goes deeper. It's like, okay, I understand there are these pointers, but how G1 tracks these pointers? Like this one here and this one here. Um, G1 has to be really precise in order to detect those pointers, because when it looks and it performs a young generation collection, it only looks at the Eden regions. It doesn't look at the whole heap, because otherwise it would be too expensive. So. Before we go into that, um, I'll tell you that there is a one more data structure that is very important that is called the remember set, okay? This is the data structure that remembers for this particular Eden regions, what are the objects that point to objects that live into this Eden region, okay? So basically, this one is a data structure that says, okay, there's someone from outside that points to me, all right? And I remember where these guys from outside are in this remember set, okay? There's also an additional uh, data structure called the card table, which is here, which uh, tells inside this particular region where exactly are the external guys, okay? The points to this region. So how does exactly G1 tracks uh, the inter-region pointers? Well, it installs what is called a write barrier. Basically, this one is a small piece of code that the JVM injects into uh, the code that you are actually running every time you do this operation in the code. Object.field equals something, all right? So G1 basically says, okay, I need to change the value of this field here, but not only I change the value, I also run a little bit of code that allows me to keep track of inter-region pointer. Because at that point, um, G1 knows what is this object and what is this object, okay? So G1 knows both objects. It knows the one that it's pointed to and the one that it's pointing to. And so it can keep track of all the information about this pointer. Every time a pointer is written, G1 stores the information in the card, okay? So here, it, it says, basically, it marks this card and say, okay, this is dirty, okay? And then puts that information into a queue, into a separate queue that it's called the dirty card queue, all right? And then this queue is divided into four zones here. There's a white, uh, green, yellow, and red zone, and uh, as my application runs, my application modifies pointer, this queue grows up, okay? Many modification to objects existing in that particular region are created, and so this queue fills up, okay? When, until the number of entries stays in the white zone, nothing happens. When the number of entries exceeds the white uh, zone and enters the green zone, threads, background threads, are started by G1, these threads are called refinement threads. And what these threads do is basically they go back here and they say, okay, I know there is a queue somewhere that points to these regions here. I want to update the remember set. I want to, you know, be sure that uh, this data structure here is totally up to date. Why does it do that? Why doesn't it update the remember set immediately? Well, because um, updating the remember set immediately is very costly. This data structure will be heavily contended. Imagine several threads all trying to write to this particular remember set. Instead, what it does is says, okay, let's use a queue. The queue is a much cheaper data structure to hold information. I store information into the queue and then I fire up a background thread that every time there is a change, this thread basically writes here while the application is running, okay? 
So because it's a G1 thread, then G1 knows everything. It's the only one writing to this data structure, so that's good. When we enter the yellow zone, basically, um, G1 has started all the refinement threads. And when we enter the red zone, so there's many, 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 many changes that fill up this queue very quickly, then um, G1 uses a trick. It says, OK, I don't queue any more these changes, but I ask the application to do the change. Okay? By asking the application to do the, the garbage collection work, then the application has to run an additional bit of code. So that additional bit of code that was not run before uh, slows down the application. By slowing down the application, I slow down the rate that the application modifies pointer. And therefore, I give G1 a little bit of time and space to, in order to catch up and drain the queue in order to update their member set. OK? So, this is uh, basically what, what's about the refinement threads. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that you could find for every explanation you find on the internet about G1. They say, oh, and by the way, there are these parameters, G1, uh, conch refinement, green zone. But there's no, really no explanation of why, what is this green zone, red zone, yellow zone, or whatever. So that's the research that I've done in order to understand why these are important. and. Uh, and um, it, how you want to tune it. What is the meaning behind these uh, refinement threads? So now let's go into a little bit more detail about the G1 young generation phases. Um, what happens when G1 performs a young GC? Well, the young generation collection in G1 is still a stop the world collection. So the first thing that G1 does is stops the thread. All the application threads are stopped. And then at that point, G1 waits for all the thread to stop, which could take time. And uh, G1 at that point builds what's called the collection set. We'll uh, remember this because we're going back to the collection set concept a little bit later when we look at the old generation phase. Um, so basically, what's the collection set? It's all the regions that G1 wants to look at during that particular collection, OK? So because it's a young collection, then in the collection set, there will be all the add-on regions and all the survival regions, all right? Because I don't want to look at the old regions now. It's a young collection. So I just look at the add-on and survival. The first phase that G1 does while the, the, the world is stopped is what is called the root scanning. Uh, so G1 has to start from known places that are known to be alive. Um, so for example, uh, static field uh, members in classes, uh, but also all the local variables that you have in your stack uh, in, for, for each thread. So what it does is basically G1 walks the thread stack and say, OK, um, I am in the middle of executing this method. This method has. Uh, allocated or referenced somehow local variables. And therefore, the object pointed to by those local variables are alive, because you know I'm using them in this thread. So those are alive. And so it, it searches the first frame, then it goes back one frame, and, and more frame, and frame, until it arrives at the top of the frame, the stack frames. The second phase that it does is updating the remember set. Remember the queue, the dirty car queue? It may be that, for example, the, the, uh, my application doesn't change uh, references uh, very often. So all the changes are still in the white zone of the queue. Or maybe a thread has been spawned to actually help uh, the uh, updating the remember set, but hasn't finished yet. There are still entries in the dirty car queue. So this phase is basically about draining the dirty car queue and updating the remember set in order uh, to have the remember set give a consistent view of who is pointing to that particular add-on region. Okay? The third phase is, OK, now that I have uh, all the data that I want, I want to process that data. So I want to go to the remember set, follow the pointers back to all the old regions, figure out what are the objects that points to me, and really understand if that partic uh, what are the objects that are alive in the set and region. Okay, so I go there, follow the pointers, and say, okay, object. Uh, remember object D before? Uh, yeah, that object is alive. Okay, so I check it and say, okay, this guy is alive. 
So this is the processing the remember set. The fourth phase is what is called the object copy. And this is a very important phase because it does many things at once. So now that I know who are the live objects, what happens is this. OK, let me start from the roots. Let me follow all the object graph of the known objects that I know are alive. Okay. And why I am traversing the object graph and following the pointer to children and then grandchildren and so forth, I can do many things. One of the things is basically I can copy those objects from one region to another. Okay, I copy the roots, then I follow the pointers, copy the children, follow the pointers, copy the grandchildren, and so forth. Okay, but while I'm in traversing the graph, I can also keep track of what kind of object they are. Okay? In particular, I keep track of whether the object is a soft, weak, phantom, final, or Gini weak reference. Because I want to keep those aside, because I want to process those uh, a little bit later. Okay? Not only that, while I'm traversing this object graph, I can also keep track of how long does it take to me to uh, to clean up one single region, or many regions, or the whole head in, in uh, survival regions, so I can keep track of the times. Um, so, well, basically, the object copy is mainly about copying the object from one Eden region to either another Eden region or a survival region. So the fifth, fifth phase is, well, because I've traversed the graph, I kept track of the references, then I want to to do the reference processing. And I want to know, oh, OK, this is a weak reference. Um, maybe the heap is, uh, is full. I better clean this object and you know, clean the weak reference and then schedule it for garbage collection. Um, and so I do that. You can enable these two uh, switches if you want to have the parallel processing to, uh, sorry, the reference processing to be done in parallel by multiple threads. By default, is done by a single thread. And you can also um, add the switch in order to get more information about, for example, how many references uh, G1 has processed. This could be very interesting information, because if you have like uh, numbers, well, it depends on the heap size, but typically if you have very large numbers, like it says in the millions of uh, references, then probably you have a problem in your application. Or there's a library there's allocating a lot of weak references that are immediately um, thrown away. So because this operation is costly, you want to try to minimize it. So as I said before, G1 tracks the phases and the times it takes to, um, uh, to, to run through the young generation collection. And why does it do that? Remember at the beginning that you could tell G1 what is the maximum stop the world pose that you're willing to accept? Well, that's the reason why I keep track of the time. Because if I have to process 100 regions and uh, this 100 region takes too much, what is the solution that G1 takes in order to respect the max GC pose that you have given to it? Well, I can just r reduce the number of regions that I'm processing, right? So. If instead I can do the, the Eden region process very quickly and the target is much larger, then I can say, well, I can use more regions and therefore my GC will become uh, less frequent in time because the Eden regions grows and grows and grows and it's larger. And in order to fill it, it takes more time. Okay? So by doing less collections, there is less overhead on the throughput of your, of your application. So G1 is something that it wants to do it. It wants to keep your application running as much as possible. Okay? And have GC to be done as rarely as possible. So G1 tries to enlarge the Eden generation up to the point where it can respect the max GC pose target that you've given to it. When it cannot do that, it shrinks the, the Eden size. All right? So it's a kind of a simpler algorithm. But we'll see uh, in the real life, uh, you know, by parsing the log, we've seen a very peculiar uh, behavior of G1 that it's very typical of his algorithm. And I'll, uh, I'll show you in a moment. So graphically, this is, happens, this is what happens, basically. So uh, this is the heap at a certain point. Uh, G1, uh, young generation uh, collection triggers. 
And what happens is this, that uh, few regions are chosen and, um, you know, survival regions, Eden regions are chosen. We say, okay, I want to relocate all these regions in another region. And basically, you and our uh, survival region also can become here. Maybe this survival region contains um, a, n a number of objects that are always alive. You know, maybe objects that you have allocated at the beginning of your application and stay alive for the whole duration of your application. And so maybe what happens is this. We have a new survival region here, a new survival region, and all the regions. And this one, where I started from, become empty. All right? And I can fill them up again. You with me so far? Yes? Good. So let's go to the old generation now, which is a little bit more complicated, but at the end it's very similar because it piggybacks on, on the young generation. So what happens when at a certain point, the heap fills up, um, as we have seen here, survival region go into old regions, so the number of old regions grows and grows and grows and grows, and at a certain point, I have to schedule an old generation collection, okay? So an old generation collection uh, is scheduled when the heap reaches 45% full, the whole heap. So basically, you have less than half the heap full, less than half, and then at that point, G1 says, okay, it's time to take a look at the old regions before you know, I fill the whole heap. Because if I wait too much, then it may be too late. The time that it takes for me to scan all the old regions, maybe they fill up even more, and at a certain point I go out of memory. So that's not good. So 45 is a very conservative number, and, um, and it's the default, but can be tuned with this parameter. So the old generation algorithm is uh, consists of uh, marking the live objects. The algorithm is tries to find all the live objects that are in the old regions, and uh, it does so concurrently with the application. Now, remember before, it's not only allocating your application, but it's also modifying pointers. How can G1 navigate an object graph that is actually changing? So that was another uh, doubt that I have, and I wanted to explore and understand better. So the algorithm that G1 uses, it's called three-color marking, and it works in this way. The f uh, this is an object graph, and the first thing that it does is G1 says, okay, there are roots objects that I know that are alive, for sure, and I mark these guys black. And the children, they point to, I mark them gray, and I put them in a queue, okay? Then I say, okay, let me take the first gray object out of the queue. Let's assume it's this guy here, okay? Let me analyze this guy and follow the pointers, okay? I follow the pointers, I mark the children to be gray, and when all the pointers, I followed all the pointers of that object, then that object becomes black, all right? So it becomes like this. Okay, this one is only has one pointer, so the children is marked gray, put back into the queue, and then this guy is marked black. Oh, well, let me the queue the other object. The other object happened to be this one. Let me follow one uh, pointer. So I mark the children to be gray and back in the queue, and then I have to follow the other pointer, and so I mark the children gray, put back into the queue, and then this guy is done, mark it black. All right? And therefore, you can see, okay, let's pop another gray object. It has no pointers, so all these three basically have no pointers, or they have pointers to null, right? Or maybe to scalar object like int or long or boolean or something. So I don't have to follow any pointers, so basically I mark them black. I have nothing more to follow, so I'm done. So what is the status of the heap at this point? Well, all the objects that are alive are black, and what remains are white objects that are, by definition, garbage. I cannot reach them, and therefore they are garbage, by definition. Notice also that it's very important that there is no pointer from a black object to a white object. Never. Okay? We have been black to gray, but never black to white. We have, uh, maybe in this case, we have gray to white, but never black to white, all right? This is an important um, invariant that G1 has to respect. However, 
the application is modifying pointers behind, uh, below me while I'm traversing the object graph in order to find who is alive. And so there is what is called in literature the lost object problem. And this is how it goes. I have marking in process. I'm about to analyze object B. I'm popping out of the gray queue, okay? Then the GC thread gets stopped. The application thread now does this. It does I dot C equals C. So it creates this pointer and then deletes the other one. It says B dot C equal null. So this pointer gets deleted, all right? And so, okay, that's something that an application can do. And um, suddenly the um, GC thread that was doing the marking resumes and it says, okay, let's pop out of the gray queue the object B. Oh, look, there's no pointer. I mean, the pointer is pointing to null, so I have nothing to follow. And uh, mark this object black because I'm done. But then I, we have this pointer here, which is bad, okay? So G1 solves how G1 solves this issue. This is bad because imagine I copy this object into a different region. Then I will have, from that new region, I will have a pointer that points to this C object that is considered garbage because it's white, which could be overwritten by new allocations. So I have a dangling pointer to some random code, the JVM will crash. So in order to detect this particular situation, the JVM does installs again a write barrier. And in particular, it installs a write barrier that detects every time a pointer is deleted. Uh, in particular, uh, if, I, if I can detect this, b.c equal null, I know many things. I know the pointer that I was, the object I was pointing to, I know the, the object that points to that object, so I know both of them, and I have a bunch of information that I can use for garbage collection. So this technique of remembering the deletion of a pointer is called snapshot at the beginning techniques. Uh, this is another word that comes a lot uh, when you research online for uh, how G1 works that is very seldomly explained. Nobody really says, oh, yeah, yeah, we use a snapshot at the beginning technique. Yes, but what it is exactly, you have to go buy a big book on garbage collection, and over there you can find uh, more information. But, you know, that book costs like 100 euros or something. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll go to a conference. And uh, so what G1 does is basically it speculates that the C object to whom the pointer has been deleted uh, remains alive. So if we go back to the graph here, okay, so we were in this situation. Um, yeah, here I made the case where A dot C uh, was actually, A was pointing to C, so was keeping C alive, but this may not be true. Uh, it just happened that the B pointer gets deleted, so this object is actually garbage because this one will never be created by the application, okay? However, G1 says, eh, okay, you know, it's a rare case. It's a concurrent, concurrent trace between the GC thread and the application thread. Happens rarely. I assume C will stay alive, okay? Um, and, um, and, and so this technique uh, happened to be very much more efficient. For example, CMS doesn't use this technique. And G1, in G1, they chose to use this kind of technique because they are known to be faster and, 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 and better. And, um, and so it's okay, I may retain some floating garbage, what's called C, it's a floating garbage, but it doesn't matter because on the next cycle, nobody is really pointing to C. So we'll navigate the object graph again, and uh, basically C will, be, will not be navigated and therefore will be garbage. The next cycle, I will remove C, no problem, all right? However, this gives you a hint that G1 works really well when it has more space than the strictly needed for your objects or for your, your application to write. Exactly for this reason, because it could happen that floating garbage remains there, all right? So a little bit more space, G1 works better. So let's go into the details of the G1 phases. Uh, again, it stops the world shortly. It piggybacks on a young generation collection, so performs, I'm doing an OGC. But when I'm doing an OGC, I ask the garbage collector, hey, 
by the time, do a young GC now because I need it, okay? And while you're doing the, uh, the young GC, also please record for me the old region roots so that I know where to start from, okay? Then the, one, the young generation finishes, application threads are restored, and um, the now concurrent marking can start, all right? And again, because it traverses the object graph, it can keep track of references like soft, weak, etc. And it also computes per region liveness. It can say, oh, I'm traversing this object. Okay, this object belongs to this old region. But look, there's only this one object in that particular region. It's empty. It's basically full of garbage. And it only has this one single object in there. Or it can say, hey, I'm traversing many objects. They all belong to that particular region. So that particular region is full of live objects. Okay, so, so G1 keeps track of that information. And then what it does, it stops the world again and performs what is called the remark phase. And during the remark phase, what it does is it uh, processes uh, the snapshot at the beginning queue. Remember all those C objects that G1 speculates they are alive? Okay, so it processes them, so it follows them again. Maybe they have children, so it navigates them again. And then it processes the reference, uh, uh, the typical reference processing, again during a stop the world phase. And then, of course, there is a cleanup phase because G1 says, oh, okay, while I was navigating the object graph for the old guys, turns out that that particular region, I did not navigate into that region. So it means that that region is actually full of garbage. It's completely full of garbage. So what can I do is, okay, no problem. I can reclaim immediately that region and uh, just um, you know, put it back and say, okay, you're, you're free, so you're free to receive um, you know, promotions from the young generation. And then, of course, application threads are resumed, all right? However, there's something missing, because where is it that I reclaim the regions that are partially full of live objects and partially full of garbage? There's no phase for that. And that's the real difference between CMS or other uh, algorithm and G1. We'll go into detail in a second. So this is how it looks like in the log. We have an initial uh, mark here, which um, detects the roots. And then we have concurrent, uh, concurrent um, region uh, scan. And then we have the concurrent mark starting. You see, in this case, it took like 1.67 seconds to, perform, to navigate all the object graph. And then we have the remark phase, 48 milliseconds, and then cleanup phase. You see, in this particular case, it went from 16 gigabyte to 14. So it basically reclaimed two gigabytes worth of old uh, regions that were completely full of garbage. And it took 55 seconds to do that. So I was saying, what about the non-empty, non-completely full of garbage regions, okay? And how is fragmentation resolved, all right? Well, um, this is how it works in G1. G1 perform what is called a mixed GC. What is a mixed GC? Well, a mixed GC is basically this. Um, it, G1 says, okay, I know that all these old regions are contain some live object, but also some garbage, okay? Let me divide the number of region by eight. Let's take one eighth of those number of regions and then put them into the collection set while I'm doing a young generation collection, all right? So G1 says, okay, marking is finished. Some time passes, application runs, allocates a little bit more. Eventually, the, the G1 says, okay, I need to do a young generation collection. However, there's a mixed flag turned on. So not only I have to take in account add-on regions because I'm doing a young generation collection, not only add-on and survivor, but also one eighth of the old regions because they just finished an old concurrent marking, all right? And then the algorithm is exactly identical to the young generation collection. What do I do? I, I know what are the objects alive, I navigate the object tree, and I just take the object, copy them into other regions, and I'm done, right? And that's the way G1 compacts, because it goes into an old regions, moves all the live objects, 
leave it back the garbage, and then that particular old region can be recycled, all right? And so I can compact things. I can take five, five six uh, old regions and then copy all their objects into a single old region, all right? And then reclaim the five, six old regions that I have before. So G1 is able to do compactation in this, uh, in this way, which is the big difference and the big plus that CMS was not doing. Of course, G1 is very smart, so it first targets, because it, remember, it, it counts how many live objects per each region, so it first uses and first copies in, the, in that particular 1.8, it first targets the uh, regions that are mostly empty, right? Because if I just move two objects and then that particular region I'm done, that's very cheap, and I reclaim a lot of space, so that's super good. So by default, Regions that are uh, more uh, up to 85%, uh, sorry, more than 85% full of garbage, uh, so there's only 15% alive, then um, uh, they are chosen uh, to, to be moved in that way. And there's also uh, a wasting of G1 that could say, well, you know, I know that this region contains maybe 92% of live objects and there's an 8% of garbage. But you know what? Copying those 92% of objects, it's going to be costly. So eh, I don't care about the 8% of garbage that remains there. It's OK. I don't even look at that region because I know it's going to be very expensive for very little gain. Maybe I reclaim, I don't know, a few bytes, maybe a few kilobytes, but you know, it's not worth it. OK? So you can tell G1 and say, OK, you can waste 5% of the heap in that way. Don't worry. All right, so then the application runs again, and then more add an allocation. Again, a young generation collection is triggered, and then at that point, I can take the second eight of the old regions and look at that second eight, and so forth. The more I go into the, this eight uh, slices, the less those regions will be efficient to reclaim so G1 can stop and say, well, okay, you know, yeah, I had to do eight mixed GC, but you know, I reclaimed enough space, even if I do maybe three. So the other five, I'm not gonna do it. You know, I'm going to waste a little bit of heap, but it's okay. So graphically, again, this is what happens. I, you know, target all generations regions here, but also uh, add-in regions and survivor regions, and then I just move them, and you know, from the old that was here, it goes into the old that was here, but now it's compacted, and this one can be used to overflow from survivor to old and you know compact uh, even more. And so I reclaim space in this way. All right, so this is basically how G1 works. Now let's go for the advices and um, what what you have to do to to actually uh, perform well. So avoid at all cost full GCs. This is like a mantra that we have to, to do every time. And um, well, why? Because again, full GC and G1 are single threaded. And believe me, they are really slow. And you don't want to go there at all. Um, avoid another uh, situation, which is this one. Uh, yeah, you have free space, but whenever you have to you know, collect all the Sedon region and survival regions, it may be that, sorry, that they don't fit into this single region. So that situation is called the two-space exhausted. You don't want to do that. When you encounter a two-space exhausted, it means that your heap is too small. You have to enlarge your heap, give room to G1 to function properly, all right? Um, because all the live objects that could be here, I mean, all these regions could be totally empty, could be full of garbage, and then, yes, you can get away Right? You copy zero object and you're good. But if it turns out that the live objects in the Eden region overflowing here, they cannot fit, then two space exhausted, yeah, and you go back to a full GC. Also avoid humongous allocation because humongous objects are treated very specially in the G1 code. Uh, there are special paths that need to be followed when you do humongous allocation, when, you, when G1 goes over and says, oh, I have humongous regions around, so I need to treat these uh, specialties and so forth. So basically, G1 executes more code 
if you do humongous allocations. And you know, executing more core, uh, code, it means that the collection will last longer. So again, you don't want to do that. Uh, how do I solve uh, humongous allocation? Well, you just make the regions bigger, right? If before I was allocating maybe um, 12 megabyte array into a 32 gigabyte uh, region, sorry, uh, into a 16 megabyte region, then it meant that uh, because uh, remember 50%, so any object that is larger than an 8 megabyte, it's going to be a humongous object. So I w it was 12, so it was humongous. Okay, if I double up the region size and go to 32 megabytes, then the limit for humongous is now 16, and now 12 megabytes is not, is not humongous anymore. Okay, so super cool. Uh, reference processing is something that beat us. Um, well, you know, if you connect, um, for example, a J console to a living production web application, RMI is creating uh, weak references. So, you know, that could be later one or uh, could be a lot of them. So pay attention to that. Thread locals also allocate uh, weak references. And you know, take a look at also third-party libraries that you know. Real-world example. So where's the real meat is? So this one was a, a customer of us, um, online chess games. Uh, this single server uh, was running on Jetty. It was doing 20,000 requests per second. Uh, single server, pretty beef, uh, 64 gigabyte, uh, 32 cores, something. Uh, I think it was 2 by 12. I think it's a mistake here, so 24 cores. So it had an allocation rate uh, 0 0.5 to 1.2 gigabytes per second. Uh, that's pretty high. Um, but this application was running like 24 hours a day. So you know during nights it was 0 0.5, but still running. And during peaks, uh, 1.2. And we went from CMS to G1. So first bump that we hit into is that, oh, we moved to JDK 8. The permanent generation is gone. Yes, thank you. Uh, it has been replaced by something that is called the metadata space, rather than being a permanent generation space. So they just changed the name. And now instead of throwing out of memory error, it says, ah, OK, I need to expand. So let me do a full GC. <laughs> and for a web application like this one with 20,000 requests per second, if you stay still for 14 seconds, basically you have a, an outage. And uh, that's not good. Um, you know, imagine how, I don't know, I didn't do the math, but how, how many requests have been ignored in these 14 seconds when you have 10, 20K per second? So it's a lot. So the problem is that, well, it's easy to fix. You just enlarge the meta space size. Uh, the problem is that you have no idea how big it must be. So, you know, you have to try an error, try an error. So do your homework be before you go to production. The second issue is the target pose. We said, OK, let's go with 250. And then we collected a 24-hour run, and then we ran the percentiles on uh, how long did you really pose, right? So it turned out that only 50% of the poses were less or equal than 250 milliseconds. The other 50% of poses were greater than that. Up to the 100 percentile, there was three times that. So. G1 tries to respect the max GC pose. In our particular case, this was the result that we got. So, you know, your mileage may vary, your application may be different, but, you know, still not respecting that as a maximum, more respecting that as a median, okay? Know that you're going to be around there rather than that it's the maximum. Third, the most interesting behavior is mixed GC. All right, so remember when I told you what is it the G1 does when it has to um, stay into the time, right? It shrinks the add-on generation, all right? So this is what happens, however, when you have to take into account that one-eighth more regions, all right, what G1 has to do? Well, what, that one-eighth of all the regions that has to be taken into account for mixed GC takes time. And therefore, G1 said, well, because it takes more time, I have to shrink the add-in. So in this particular log line, you can see that the add-in went from 12.4 gigabytes to 0.6. That's 20 times smaller. 
you went from here to here. But what is it that remained the same? The application didn't stop running. It was still allocating one gigabyte per second. So if before it was taking 12 seconds to allocate, you know, to fill the add-in, now it's taking 0 0.6 seconds to fill the add-in, right? So this is what happens, basically. This parameter is called the minimal mutator utilization and basically says how long in a period of time is your application actually running, all right? And so this is what happens. This is the events that happen. So this is about 10 seconds apart. So you have young GC, dun, 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 10 seconds pass, another young GC, boom, 10 seconds, another young GC, boom. And then in the meanwhile here, the marking was finished. And then at this point, G1 decided that it had to do mixed GC and shrank the add-in generation to 0 0.6, all right? So what happens is now, bam, bam, young generation, bam, 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 bam. Finally, I finished my to process the mixer GC, and I can enlarge again the add-in generation and go back to just doing young generation GCs. All right, my add-in is now enlarged again, but during this period of time, I was doing frantically. Uh, young generation collection one after the other. This is how the graph of the add-in size looked like. It was 12 gig here, brrr, down to almost less than one, and then slowly recovering up. And this is the minimum mutator utilization. So if you take a two second window and you say, the ideal point is that during those two seconds, only my application runs, okay? That's 100%. If within those two seconds I have a uh, collection, uh, garbage collection activity, then my application does not run, okay? And so I have a dip here, right? So this is a young generation. No, okay, I go to down to 85 maybe or something. Uh, 95 here, 90, whatever. But here, during the mixer, you see, I go from 100% down to 40. It means that even if each single pose of G1 respects the target that you gave, um, these poses are basically 200 milliseconds of GC pose, then one millisecond application run, then 200 millisecond uh, GC pose, one millisecond application run. Basically, your application tries to run, but the GC is always interrupting her. So it doesn't run your application. Still, you're respecting the pose, but only your application only runs 40% of the time during that particular window. And that could be bad because if you look at the logs, you see, oh, everything's going great. I'm respecting the GC poses, but why is the customer complaining? Okay, well, it's complaining because it's actually making a request exactly at this point, and the system is not responsive. All right, so this is important to know because it will help you out if you have to figure out problems in your application that are not evident from the logs. Because if you look at the logs, all the poses are really good within the time that you gave them. So you have to graph them and graph in particular the minimum mutator utilization and see if you have big downs here. This is the same graph, but over a five seconds windows. You see that even in five seconds, which is a human time to click on user interface and something, the application was ro only running at 60% of its capacity, all right? So conclusions, um, G1 is the future. It's going to be default in JDK 9. There are very good chances that you just set the maximum heap size and the target pose, and it will just work. However, uh, it's easier to tune the CMS, more or less, but you have to know it. You have to understand how it works because you may be surprised by some behavior that it's not evident in G1. So, you know, for us, it was a, a very interesting quest in understanding G1, understanding how it works, and understanding why customers were complaining even though, though the application seemed to run really well. It is still based on a stop the world algorithm. So for if you really need to go to extremely low poses in the you know less than one milliseconds, you may want to look at some different solution uh, which are available. Um, and um, always use the most recent JDK because they are working very actively on it. They are fixing bugs, improving performance, 
every single day. If you're subscribed to the Hotspot GC mailing list, you'll see a ton of emails of a ton of improvement and basically everything relates to G1. The work on CMS and parallel collector is reduced to a bare minimum, like, I don't know, less than 1%. So go G1. A few references, you can you know, go to SlideShare, search for G1 GC, you find a bunch of authors that uh, put out uh, information. Um, uh, Oracle's uh, sites, OpenJDK uh, mailing list, they're really kind. If you give them your logs, they are able to parse your logs, understand what's going on, and you know, of course, when they have time, but it's, uh, they are very useful. They, they give you suggestions on how to tune G1 if you have problems. So with that, I'm done. My time is out. So thank you for listening. And if you have questions, uh, I'll be around here and uh, you can stop me by and ask me anything you want. Thanks.